Good morning. Welcome to Wesley here at the heart of the University of Illinois campus. I'm Pastor Dan king Crady, and today we welcome back Reverend Ann Spurgeon to share a message with us on the Gospel of Matthew and a reading in 1 Corinthians. It's always a pleasure to anticipate Ann's preaching because it's always so thoughtful and meaning-filled. We'll hear from her later in today's service. This is Memorial Day weekend, and the history of Memorial Day is full of complex issues and twists and turns, going back to just after the Civil War when a group of former slaves in South Carolina celebrated and remembered their losses and their loved ones just after the Civil War. We recognize and remember those who serve in the armed forces, and we also remember those who have given up their life, the greatest sacrifice. I invite you today to consider also your loved ones, because Memorial Day weekend is a time when many of us gather and reflect on our family members. And in this year of pandemic, with over 275,000 United States citizens dead, over 3.5 million people worldwide dead, there are many of us who are sad about the loss of our family and our friends. That's part of this year's Memorial Day weekend. Let's center ourselves, reflect, and remember as we share in the presence of God.
as we continue deeper into worship, I want to remind you of two important dates. Next Sunday, June 6, is Pastor Deborah's last Sunday here at Wesley. Now, you can experience that service online at 9.30, as you are today, but you can also come to the parking lot next Sunday at 11.15. And Pastor Deborah will be preaching both services, but at 11.15, you'll have an opportunity to speak to her face-to-face, tell her how much she means to you, and say farewell. So next Sunday, Pastor Deborah, and then the following Sunday, two weeks from today, June 13th, will be our first in-person 930 worship service here in the sanctuary. It has been a long wait, but I hope you can come on June 13th at 930. Just remember to wear a mask. But if you can't come that time, at 1115, we'll have our regular Zoom service, just as we have for the last 15 months. Hope to see you one way or the other on June 6th and June 13th. Right now, would you join in our responsive greeting? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Wesley United Methodist Church is a diverse, welcoming, and affirming community united in Christ. We welcome and extend the grace of God to everyone. We extend God's grace to everyone we meet and even to those who we have not met. And the risk in that is when Jesus said to love your enemies, we have to consider where our grace is being extended, even to those who we might consider our enemies, even those who we don't understand completely. Consider that on this Memorial Day weekend. But right now, let's join in the call to worship and draw one another closer to God and to each other. It is no small gift to be a faith community. To to worship, worship, to to witness, witness, to, to walk, walk the way, way of love in the, in the name, name and strength of Jesus. And in community, when brokenness and sorrow come, those in need are surrounded with, with prayer and, and compassion. compassion. Our caring goes beyond ourselves. And, and the, the stranger, stranger in, in many, many places, places is touched by the love and grace of God. God. In our failures, in our busy forgetting, We We are are forgiven, forgiven, renewed renewed to to continue to be be the hands and feet of Christ. No No small small task, no no small small gift. Our opening hymn is in the hymnal 156, I Love to Tell the Story. Let's sing it together. consider our prayer life this week, we're aware that it is the anniversary of George Floyd's murder. We want to keep all persons in our prayers who face the frustration, the anxiety, the fear of being African American in this country and living in situations where they do not know what might happen with local police. Even as we support and understand that so many of our police officers are well-trained and trained in the ways of de-escalation. We recognize that not everyone is. Please keep all of our people in your prayers. We also lift up 
the shooting in San Jose, California, and the friends and families of those who were killed this last week. It's a terrible tragedy, and our hearts go out to all of those involved. We received word that Barbara Scott continues to be at OSF Hospital. Uh, the family hopes she can go home soon, and so do we, but please keep Barbara and family in your prayers. We also are so um, caring and concerned about Allison and Dylan Boot, or who are having to live in separate places right now. Allison, of course, at home in Urbana. Dylan living in a care facility in Jacksonville, Illinois, as he awaits surgery. Please keep them in your prayers, and Dylan for his health. There is a tenuous ceasefire between Gaza and Israel at the time that we're recording this, and we pray that even as you hear it in your home, you will continue to pray for that situation and to pray for peace, which is the hope and foundation of a ceasefire forever. We received good news. Uh, Go uh, Bill and Doe Gordon uh, report that Bill's doing much better as he continues to recover from his heart procedure. Please keep Bill in your prayers. We also heard from Brent and Kristen Dean Grossman. Brent's cancer has not returned, and we are so thankful to God for this joy, this wonderful celebration. Please continue to keep Kristen and Brent in your prayers. And now let's join in the ancient call and response as we prepare our hearts and minds for prayer. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Our perspectives are so limited, God. We tend to see only what's in front of us at the moment. It's difficult to look back more than a few decades or look forward more than our own limited lifetimes. But being in relationship with you invites us to consider our lives, our actions, even our prayers as more significant than just this moment in time and space. It's hard, God, because the world is such a practical place where people usually love those who love them and hate those who hate them. But you call us to be impractical people. You ask us to love those who hate us, even to love our enemies. God, it goes against our very natures not to despise those who have despised us. Yet Jesus managed to love his enemies praying for you to forgive the very people who crucified him. And you call us to be like him. Oh God, we cannot do this on our own. And so we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit upon us and change us into the people who can no longer hate. Let the heavenly love that flowed through Christ flow through us as his followers. Help us to change the world he wanted so much to change. Teach us to be Christ to those we do not trust, to those whom we do not know, to our enemies. People may ridicule us and say we're naive. They may even persecute us for being like Jesus. The only thing that really matters to us, O oh God, is doing your will and following Jesus to the best of our ability. For as the prayer says, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, and that is all that really matters in the perspective of eternity. All this we pray in the power and presence of Jesus who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's lift up our voices and sing a hymn. It's number 150 in the United Methodist hymnal, God Who Stretched the Spangled Heavens. 
You might want to stand. You'll sing better. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. O oh God, as we open the pages of the scriptures, show yourself to us. Inspire us to hear a message for our day. Amen. First scriptures from Matthew 25, 34 through 40. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, O oh blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see thee hungry, and feed thee, or thirsty, and give thee drink? And when did we see thee a stranger, and welcome thee, or a naked, and clothe thee? And when did we see thee sick, or in prison, and visit thee? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of my brethren, you did it to me. Our second scripture is from 1 Corinthians twelve fourteen through 28 For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? And if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? 
But as it is, God arranged the organs in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single organ, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body which seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we invest with greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior part, that there may be no discard in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, then healers, helpers, administrators, speakers, and various kinds of tongues. Words inspired by God for the inspiration of the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. In the upper room with I'm with 
in my in the upper room. Don't you know that I'm in the upper room? In the upper room. In the upper room. In the upper room. First, I'd like to read a poem by Maxine Rose called The Body of Christ. It is a reflection on the reading from 1 Corinthians 12. The eyes are people who always see, the ones who take the time when they find a need. The ears are people who are kind with words, and the smallest whisper is always heard. The lips are people who know what to say, they make you feel wanted in their own special way. The heart is people who are willing to give, and they give freely just as Jesus did. The hands are people who have that touch without saying anything, they say so much. The feet are the people who walk to you when the pain's so deep that you can't move. Trying as the trials and temptations may be, May they always find a little Jesus in me. A little Jesus. In the past few decades, I have become disheartened in the prevailing image of Christianity reflected especially in the media. The loudest voices are not always in keeping with my understanding of Christianity. When powerful and popular Christian leaders declare that an earthquake in Haiti was caused by people's pact with the devil, that 9-11 terrorist attacks occurred because of American pagans, feminists, gays, and lesbians, and the ACLU, and Hurricane Katrina was God's wrath aimed at the high level of sin in New Orleans, I cringe. How can anyone find a little Jesus in these loud voices? And in addition, how can we reconcile the linking of politics and religion as they are so often linked today? And why would anyone struggling with their place in the world think of turning to Christianity as a way to find value and purpose, a way to find God's love, comfort, forgiveness, and grace with these disingenuous displays. I am also troubled with the seeming disparity with which different people understand Christianity. When I was in the fifth grade, I went to a vacation Bible school. One day in class, the teacher held up a globe. As she talked about the importance of being a Christian, she pointed to places in the globe that were not Christian. She said we had to be Christian to get to heaven, otherwise we'd go to hell. I raised my hand. 
What happens to the people in China and Africa who haven't heard about Jesus? If they become Christians, she said, they'll be fine. Then the teacher took her hand and swept it across the globe over China and Africa and said, otherwise they will all go to hell. I saw screaming people falling from the globe into the fires of hell. Horrified, I said, I don't think God would do that. She gave me an angry look. You don't know what you're talking about, she said. I have continued to encounter this divergence in the understanding of God throughout my life. As a part of my training in church growth and development, I attended many workshops and conferences on evangelism. At some moment in most every one of these conferences, a point would be made that the reason for bringing new people into a congregation was to convert them to a particular kind of Christianity so they would be saved from hell. At the end of one such conference, I must have looked distressed because an elderly pastor who was sitting next to me turned to me and said, sometimes I think these people forget that love is the reason that we bring people into the church and not just conversion. Puzzled yet relieved, I said, it makes me question whether <clears throat> or not I'm a Christian. He continued, there are two types of Christians, two types of Christian evangelism. Those that follow the Great Commission go into the world and make disciples of all nations. And those who follow the Great Commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. I am a love Christian, he said. This conference isn't for love Christians. It's for go and make disciple Christians. I think I might have gasped, and then I said, thank you, I agree. This divergent understanding has taken a toll in other places. Dr. Clara Swain was a Methodist medical missionary who started a groundbreaking hospital for women in India. In the prevailing Indian culture of the 1860s, a woman could not be in the presence of a man who was not a relative, and so women were unable to go to a doctor because all doctors were male. To get medical care, a woman had to tell a male relative what was wrong, and that relative would take that information to a male doctor who would interpret, diagnose, and prescribe. The male relative would then return to the woman to give her the news, with results that often had the accuracy of a game of telephone. Through her work as a female medical doctor, Clara Swain was able to treat women directly. She built a hospital that reflected the cultural needs of the women and was the first medical hospital for women and children in India. This hospital still stands today and has saved many lives through reimagining the medical care of women in India. Yet, at the end of her life, Clara Swain felt that her mission work had failed because she had only brought a small handful of people to Christ. Whenever I think about this story, it makes me sad because I don't think Clara could see what I see, that there was a lot of Jesus in her work and in her life. There is a distinct disparity in American Christianity, and there is something that has nagged at me about it this whole time. I believe everyone should have a place at the table. By that I mean Christians that worry me and Christians that I agree with, the go and make disciple Christians and the love your neighbor Christians. I think that there should be a logical way to feel comfortable 
with this inclusion, but such comfort has evaded me. Then I read Maxine Rose's poem, The Body of Christ. Many years ago, John and I were involved with McDowell Mission in West Virginia. Its main focuses were based on the scripture reading from Matthew 25 that was read this morning. Feed the hungry, welcome the stranger, clothe the naked, and so on. This is in keeping with John's and my understanding of mission work, to serve, help, and give hope. While we were at McDowell, we met Maxine Rose. Maxine was poor, uneducated, and was caring for eight children, four of her own, and four of the second wife of her ex-husband who lived next door. She is still doing this. Maxine became involved with McDowell Mission because of her family's poverty. Through the mission, she learned to read and write, and encouraged by the staff at McDowell, she started writing poetry and devotions. Her poem, The Body of Christ, has become a touchstone for me. It defines for me in the middle of my Christianity muddle in my distress over trying to get everyone to the table. It defines for me my goal, my reason, my purpose for being a Christian. The Body of Christ by Maxine Rose. The eyes are people who always see, the ones who take time when they find a need. The ears are people who are kind with words and the smallest whisper is always heard. The lips are people who know what to say. They make you feel wanted in their own special way. The heart is people who are willing to give, and they give freely, just as Jesus did. The hands are people who have that touch. Without saying anything, they can say so much. The feet are people who walk to you when the pain's so deep that you can't move. Trying as the trials and temptations may be, may they always find a little Jesus in me. As many times as I've read this poem through the years, I'm still struck by that last sentence. This seemingly simple poem with its hard to accomplish conclusion, takes the focus off conflicting theologies and profoundly states the reason for our Christian faith. To reflect Jesus, to try to be Jesus in the world, in our lives, in our families. Jesus who ate with sinners, who loved the unlovable, who forgave his enemies in the midst of the trial on the cross, who allowed his mind to be changed, who stood with those on society's fringe, who charged us to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, welcome the stranger, tend to the sick, visit the prisoner. It is with this poem that I can reclaim Christianity. I can take it back from those who have abused it, have misrepresented it in the media, who have captured and claimed it for political gain. Trying as the trials and temptations may be, may they always find a little Jesus in me. With those words, I can scoop up all the people that my VBS teacher brushed off into hell. I can see the accomplishment of the creation of a culturally sensitive hospital in India. I can find Jesus no matter where I go and work to dissolve boundaries, and I can freely embrace those who believe and understand differently than I do, Christian or not. Because this poem challenges me to remember that my objective is not to convert, 
or change minds or judge or condemn or measure righteousness. It allows me to rise above the questioning fray and pray, may they always find a little Jesus in me. May they always find a little Jesus. Amen. Good morning. I'm Deborah Jung Mi Kang, Associate Pastor. I really appreciate Pastor Anne's message. She's always supportive, compassionate, and also loving the good news of Jesus Christ. And also her message is a reminder of how we can be active in loving God and our neighbors rather than forcing them to change. We can change ourselves as we follow God's call in our actions. Through your actions, you can support to Wesley all great ministries, food pantry ministry, our campus strength ministry, children and youth ministry, social action ministry, environmental justice ministry, and also West Care, Congregational Care Ministry. I recently had a chance to speak with one of the newcomers. She had come to Wesley with her husband regularly before the pandemic, and she was finding some meaningful way to support Wesley, and then she is so joyful to work with the West Care members for church members who are shut ins were hospitalized, or needed God's love and care. So exciting to see that beautiful connection with her gift and leadership. Uh, if you plan to bring your tithe and offerings, you can check the website of Wesley, and also uh, click the giving page, and send your check directly to Salamundi, and also use the QR code electronically. Thank you for all your great commitments and services in empowering one another and also building up the community. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Today, instead of after prayer, I'm happy to share the words from Roberta Porter. This is a very inspiring message aligned with Pastor Anne's sermon. Amazing love God has for us that calls us, stops us, turns us around, and changes us. Our old way of being does not disappear instantly, but in each day. Each situation we encounter, the Christ who lives in us can touch our hearts, our minds, our attitudes. By the Spirit, we are changed to live a life of love, to give ourselves away for God, caring for those God places in our paths. That's a very inspiring message. The next hymn we are going to sing is United Methodist Hymnal 581, the title, Lord, whose love through humble service. The words are really good. We, your servants, bring the worship, not only voice alone, but also heart, consecrating to your purpose every gift that you impart. 
Let's sing along with the uh, music leader. Lord, whose love through humble service bore the weight of human need, who upon the cross for sin. I want to give all a big applause for all college students, staff, and faculty, those who have worked so hard in their semester. So thank you for all they've done in diligent work and God's wisdom. And also, I want to share, uh, as the summer goes, all campus ministries will have a plan to reopen for the fall semester. So please check our website, uiucwesley.org, on your screen for getting more inform information for campus ministries. But David Mice, he has continued to maintain and running his ESA class. He's a student from all over the world and using some very artificial, very great articles and focusing on developing English pronunciations. So don't miss the chance to join in his class, even during the summer. You may check the information for this class 
our Wesley weekly newsletter. If you don't have any the access to this newsletter, you can contact our church secretary, Donna Giffen, D-O-N-N-A, yet WesleyUI.org. So she can guide you to receive this newsletter. Uh, it's hard to say uh, my favorite service will be next Sunday, June 6th. We'll have a parking lot service and Holy Communion music and my last sermon. And also very good time to greet in and with one another led by God's Spirit. I'm so grateful and very being proud of uh, your pastor uh, as uh, God has uh, connected me to serve uh, all of you. And I hope to see you all. <laughs> this is our benediction for all of us. May the goodness of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon you all. So bring the good news to the poor, release the captives, support to what we can do as the followers of Jesus Christ, and go forth in serving God through mercy, justice, and peace. Amen. This is the peace we can share. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. I hope you have a beautiful, restful day as you enjoy the beautiful season of summer. And also hope to see you all next Sunday in the parking lot of the Wesley.